The 1980s were a turbulent time in South African history, with the atrocities of apartheid prevalent in every state and suburb. When I was growing up, there were a number of child snatchers on the loose, and we spent a large portion of our childhood believing that at any time, someone could just take us away. I reference this with the cards worn around our necks when traveling that had our names on them and represented to me as, do not steal us. Whenever I tell funny comedic stories of my youth, I try to keep that front and center in my thinking. Apartheid. Trying to be sensitive to those who did not have the experiences that I did. I feel the weight of my white privilege. Thankfully, my family were resolutely against apartheid and so I grew up with no racism in my family home. I was taught to be kind to all people and that every person is born equal. My father was known by an Isizulu name and spoke the language fluently. I remember him sitting with his co-workers sharing lunch with him and being threatened for doing so. He was also a leading member of the first mixed race cricket team in South Africa and helped to change the government's legislation of mixed race sports. I was raised in part by an incredibly strong African woman named Lalaleni Mary Emily Njilo and witnessed firsthand her suffering at the hands of the government's archaic rules which separated mothers and their children. My sister and I in 2019 managed to locate her son Sponello and we have a good friendship with him and together we keep Mary's memory alive. Mary features in my stories sometimes. She was an absolute legend and never forgotten. My grandmother and grandfather who are mentioned in the story were also oppositional to the apartheid regime. They both did what they could with their limited scope of influence to make the lives of those around them a little easier. Each day on her way to work my gran would sit in the carriage reserved for non-whites and would get into verbal spats bordering on punch-ups with the ticket officers because she refused to move and chose to stay with her friends. The man in the woods mentioned in the story was a groundskeeper, and he had a scary appearance to me as a 12-year-old overdramatic child. And I use all jokes and references in my sketch from the viewpoint of my 12-year-old self. And at no time is there ever any purposeful stereotyping of characters. I lived in a difficult childhood, and the holidays on the farm are where some of my dearest core memories have formed. In this skit, I tried to find humor in every memory, seeing the absurd in my own behavior, and seeing the funny, weird, scary, or silly in the characters I met as a child, and in those damn geese and those thieving horses. The following is a skit that I performed at the Newcastle Civic Theater. Smith, sit still. Johnson. Friday, my room. I used to be a school teacher, can you tell? I like to establish dominance over the audience within the first three seconds of the dance. They used to say pee on them to show dominance, but I promise you. The last school was not happy. so everything is about balance for me. I even have matching turtles on my two hands, but they're adequately slightly different just to balance things out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Usually, I'd be wearing full-length fur, electronic lights across my breasts, massive antlers, and my rainbow dreadlocks that went down to the bottom. The ones I shaved for three weeks ago, crying and drinking vodka, those are the ones. So I thought, all right, do I come up here dragging the dreadlocks? Do I do a Quasimodo? Ring the bell, fall down crying because I'm a useless wretch. But no, I stepped with a beanie on to make sure my hair went just right. <laughs> Decided to wear my dad's jacket. And I'm here in my pajama pants to tell you all some stories about my childhood. But you better keep quiet for I have attention for all of you. So, I come from South Africa. People sometimes think I come from New Zealand, but no, I come from sunny old Durban. Is there anyone here who has been to South Africa? 
Oh, God bless you, bless you. Okay, you as well, fantastic. Did you bath thoroughly when you left? Because <laughs> there are germs everywhere. That place, everything wants to kill you. Very, very sick. So every holiday, we would be bundled onto an aeroplane with an Afghan lady named Mifro Fender with a scarf tied just so, just amazing, just like Doris Day. And we'd get on the aeroplane, my sister and I, with our massive playing cards, you know, please don't steal these white blonde blue eyed children. Um, and we'd go on the aeroplane. Arrive in Cape Town, my granny and grandpa in their suitable 1980s attire and perms, both of them would be waiting. Pops would do the swoop just so to cover that shiny pate on the top of the skull. So my sister and I would arrive, hop in the car, and off we go to the farm. So we spent every holiday at Dillus Fontaine Wine Estates, and it used to be a fruit farm, and it became a wine farm, and my pop was the landscape designer. So he was on his little golf cart, pruning roses all day. My grand worked for the government. She hopped on a train every day into Cape Town and came home at five. We were left pretty much to our own devices from 6 a.m. till 6 p.m. when we had to be home in time for supper and bed, like clockwork. And we were assigned a nanny in the form of the most beautiful Staffordshire Terrier named Winnie. Now, Winnie did not even live on this farm. Please bear in mind, this is a massive farm. We don't know where this dog came from. No one knows where she came from. But at 6 a.m., she was at the door. Good morning, children. I'm ready. I'm going to breakfast. Have you brushed your teeth? Well done. Fantastic. Where are we going today? So we would head off with Winnie. Winnie was a little bit controlling. and loved, 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 loved to do the same thing every day. She was a real nanny. So we had to stop by the lake. At the lake, she would nip at our heels, make sure we don't go anywhere near the water. Even turning towards the water was a scolding, instantaneous scolding from Nanny Winnie. We would lie under the fruit vines and pick all the fruits until we'd get shouted at and we'd hear the guys coming, running with the shamrock saying, Yeah, we now, what are you doing? And we'd go, Oh my god, we're gonna die! Covered in apricot juice! What a way to die! Covered in stolen fruit! What a life with these big cards. Do not steal us. <laughs> we are, this is our name, this is where we live, because we're obviously too young at the age of 12 and 9 to say our own names. Well done, Grand. Helped us make friends, I tell you. <laughs> so the one day, Winnie didn't come to the farm, so I reckon her owner maybe realised Winnie was just having a whole life, like a whole life no one knew about. Coming home every day, coming with fruit bits, getting foul feathers, horse poo. Don't, what's happening? You're over the home dog, what is going on? So Winnie would disappear from time to time. And my sister was just not up for it. She was much younger than me, she wanted to float in the crystal mineral waters of the pool that was fed by a spring. Absolutely beautiful, idyllic childhood we had there. So I decided I was going to take a bag of carrots to my ponies. Now, all right, I'm going to try and explain it. So, Grand's house, Winnie, not here, in her home. Forest, filled with murderous geese. Okay, I can't, murderous, I can't say swear words. Lake, barn, my ponies. So it was like a game of life and death. Will I make it? Do I do dun 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 dun? Like bobbing over things, turning away from his geese. They're coming at me at some point. I've been warned about that. So I decided I'm going to go see my ponies. Now, Malu was the mother. She was about so high. Miniature pony. Malu got into an unfortunate incident and gave birth to a half horse. <laughs> she never was the same, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, nothing works, okay? So midnight was yay high, identical to her mother, 100% asshole. I had to say the Nasty piece of work. So I got there very innocently with my bag of carrots, believing that we're going to have like a communion of souls. I'm going to connect. I'm going to look into these horses' eyes and communicate straight to their innermost being while I feed them carrots professionally with my fingers out of the way. I just crack a hole in there, I'm looking like a crack and the farm workers are like, hey. Okay, I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> walking on my own with my main 
went back to the house and I was like, teach me thy juju. What on earth? So I come down, very scared. My legs are no longer working. But you know, we go downstairs and we're like, downstairs. So I get down the stairs and I was like, okay, thank you, straight man. And he went off with this murderous piece. And I went to the horses and they robbed me again. Thank you very much. <laughs>